Awesome. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining. Sorry, we're a couple of minutes late. I was just figuring out how to hide my bookmarks tab, which is an important, important topic they didn't teach me in software engineering school. Um, today, we're, we're, because we're a bit late, we'll just dive straight into it. Today, we're talking about um, how to use the carbon crop platform to understand, protect, and engage your, plat your catchment. Um, so this is a bit of an evolution of the platform journey over the four years that we've been going. We've some people are using it for the purpose already, but it's it's only recently that it's sort of reached a stage where we're happy to kind of actively encourage its use, and we'll we'll sort of take you through that. Um, with me today, I've got Bex, our head of growth, and I'm Nick, um, co-founder and CEO. Um, we're sort of tag teaming your way through it. Bex is extremely conveniently for us happens to have a second hat, which is is a board member of a catchment group. So she's been very helpful as we've refined the solution. Um, as usual, questions, drop them in the Q&A panel. We've had a huge amount of questions in advance for the session, which we'll try to get through at the end. And because of that, we're going to be doing a pretty superficial treatment of a lot of the stuff that we're presenting today. There's sort of each one of the topics we could talk about for an hour. So this is really intended as a teaser rather than a deep dive. And then if you see things that are of interest to you, um, ask us to cover them in the future or even better, get in touch with us and tell us how you'd like to use it and what you're looking at using it for. Um, Bex, I'll let you start off with this one. Cool. Um, we'll, we'll use the shorthand in this webinar catchment groups, but actually what we're meaning is a much larger group of or types of groups of people who are um, active in this space, environmental groups, NGOs, catchment groups, um, private like conservation groups, local government, um, you know, professional or industry good um, groups, and they they have many different sort of names and 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 faces, but are typically all sort of going after the same objectives. Um, which go to the next slide, Nick. Um, which largely sort of fit into protecting, restoring, and strengthening. Things like biodiversity, um, waterways, and um, and communities uh, within a catchment or within a, an area. Um, and because each catchment is different, uh, they all have slightly different challenges, but can largely. I'm gonna go to the next slide now. Um, largely in a cyclical manner uh, involve funding, uh, trying to engage um, the communities within the catchments, um, alignment within the within those communities, within the people who are taking action, making decisions or funding, um, coordinating uh, stuff happening on the ground, um, planning, getting trees into the ground or getting water tested, um, a whole bunch of delivery, um, monitoring those results and building those that story um, year after year, test after test, um, and doing that consistently over a long period of time, um, generally not going for one hit wonders. Um, and this is a wee circle because those things happen again and again and again over years. Yeah, um, depend on each other historically as well, I guess. Like what you can do in year five probably depends on what you did in year three and what result that had in year four. And one that, like, even with the discussions we've had so far, one thing that's been a, like recurring is they're different and the ways in which they're different are different. Like there's there's different amounts of funding available depending on the, the stage of the catchment group and the history of the group. And even, I mean, I keep saying catchment, really we're talking about that is a shorthand, as Beck said, for a broader category of entities. Um, the current land uses across the region in question can vary wildly, and that has a big impact on the range of interventions that you could consider because it has an impact on the opportunity costs and the, the level of engagement and the enthusiasm for some of the potential interventions varies wildly based on what what sort of threats and opportunities people see. So we really, this, this loop is sort of engagement that happens in one year might feed through into funding that's available two years down the track because you can prove a larger impact. Um, yeah, it's really interesting how, how cyclical it is and how much um, it's a question of sort of integrated planning 
um, and delivery and the constant site, like, like most um, land use practices, I guess. Hmm. Do you want me to jump forward again? I think so. <clears throat> cool. Okay, um, this one is sort of a bit of um, where we've come from and where we've got to, which is almost just to, to give some perspective, especially for those who've been following the carbon crop for quite a long time. Um, some people we spoke to through the sort of engagement process were quite surprised that we were able to offer the tooling that we are offering. It's like, oh, I, th I thought you guys just um, just help people register their forests in the ETS. And like, we, we have done that and we do do that. But it's really where the company started out is that was our primary focus. We we barely gave anybody access to our tools. They were basically just internal only as we refined them. And the main form in which people interacted with our systems was they would get in touch with us to provide a service to them. We would provide some reports and similar, which were generated by our tooling, but no one ever got to log into our platform. We'd send them a PDF and then help them through the process of registering on the ETS. And the next step from that, which was sort of about a year and a half ago, I guess, was that we started making our um, our sort of our key mapping functionality and polygon management functionality available through a portal. So now landowners who are working with us could at least, they could sign in, they could see their site, they could see their reports online rather than having to find the latest PDF. I mean, it sort of got us to another stage in terms of the engagement that we could offer and the capabilities of the platform. Uh, but after that, and actually this is, the portal was probably two and a half years ago, the platform is more like one and a half years ago. Um, this was as we started to engage with some larger entities, which include major forestry developers and major primary sector organizations or very large farms. They were wanting to deal not with sort of individual farms, but with portfolios of like, for example, one of the portfolios on our platform, which is active at the moment, is more than two million hectares across several hundred farms. Um, you don't want to be dealing with that in a single giant map. There's like tens of thousands of polygons. It's completely intractable. They wanted a solution that allowed engagement and activities to be separately analyzed and tracked and planned. And, and this very much ties into what you need to do at a catchment where there's hundreds of um, landowners involved, potentially all of whom have different opportunities and different stages, but you need to be able to manage it in an integrated way. In the final stage that we sort of have really only just got to in, in any real form in the last six months, is to turn this into a multi-stakeholder, multi-market solution. So it's no longer just one perspective on all of these farms, but multiple different perspectives on all of these farms, including like the simplest form is just landholder, catchment group, re regional council, for example. They're all interested in similar information. They have different access to it and different motivations around it. And there's a lot of benefit to all of the parties to be gained if they can collaborate efficiently. Um, but if you're all just emailing each other back and forth, then it becomes very painful very quickly. Um, and there's also multiple different markets that you can pursue, which help create the funding that enables these activities to happen. So certainly true. We started out primarily helping people register their land on the ETS. From a catchment group perspective, we see the ETS primarily as one of several potential sources of funding and revenue to enable the restoration activities. It's not the primary focus. Anything you want to add there, Bex? Yeah, no, I think that that's a good summation of the journey. Um, I think for the, as Nick said initially, there's there's a lot that we could show you. Um, so we thought we would look at it with a lens of how we might use carbon crop for my catchment. Um, we're relatively new. Um, and so starting out, um, and so the first, the first step uh, is really to understand un understand that catchment from from the top down, um, almost as if our catchment was one gigantic farm, um, looking for all of the the opportunities. What is is there in the first place? Um, that might look like where are all of the existing native forest remnants that we could help restore and protect. Um, where are all of the native forests which are not yet registered in the ETS but are eligible? Um, where are potential sites for future forest planting that could help us reduce erosion and sediment into our waterways? Um, and how can we better and more quickly engage with the farmers within our catchments um, 
through things like carbon or the ETFs and help make them more accessible. So those are probably some of the, the, the four things that we thought we would we would show you today. All right, into it. Um, so to start off with, we thought we'd have uh, a bit of a look at how, like one of the key steps as Bex just sort of alluded to is if you're starting analyzing a catchment or any area, the key question is what even what even am I analyzing? and what is actually there, at least at a high level sort of perspective. So if we consider, and here I've created a sort of a, a micro catchment example covering a couple of valleys on Banks Peninsula, which I live near and know quite well. Um, first thing you wanna do is get all of the land that comprises the area into a place where you can analyze it. And one way you could do this is just say, please give me this 100,000 hectares, but you're not going to engage with that land at the level of 100,000 hectares because that 100,000, well, except for some very extreme cases like the Ordland, you might. Um, but the 100,000 hectares is actually probably broken up to a couple of hundred people, all of whom have their own particular situations and their own opportunities and their own perspectives and their own current statuses. And so our view is, and this has been reinforced by many of the groups we've talked to, you want it, the regional view, but broken up by the basically the farms or the or the blocks of land whether they're a farm or some other level of activity because that's the resolution at which you're likely to be engaging at it in the next step so we enable you to do that in one go you define your hundred thousand hectares you create representations of every block of land within that hundred thousand hectares within our platform but they're all created as independent entities which can be analyzed separately right from the word go and you get some automated land cover for all of them as sort of the first thing that allows you to start making decisions. So hopefully if I change that, you can see a new screen. Woohoo, it works. <laughs> um, I keep jumping. So this has been done for an area over on, um, if I zoom out, you'll sort of get a sense of, it's basically the region comprising, can you see my cursor? Yeah. Comprising these sort of two valleys over here, Le Bons Bay and Hickory Bay, which are next door to each other. Um, and the... All of the farm, well, I haven't actually added all of the farms just to keep it manageable for talking you guys through it, but we've got 13 farms within those two areas covering a total of 2,150 hectares. And we've started breaking down the, not just the area of the farms, but the aggregate forest area within those farms. The total forest cover in this case is quite high because it's relatively lightly farmed and a lot of it's regenerating forest. There's around 1,000 hectares of forest. Um, and within any one of those farms, you can sort of dip into it and I had a good one that I was going to start with I think it was um Hickory oh, Crown Reserve 4 so this is up the top of Hickory Bay it's Crown Land just so I don't go showing you guys somebody particular farm right out of the gate um so you can see it's automatically been mapped for the vegetation cover um I haven't touched this site at all this is all stuff that's the um systems done rather than myself um we've estimated the current carbon removals across the entire area and the current carbon stock. This is based on regenerating native forest, although a lot of this is actually mature forest. So you'll see that many of these areas aren't being attributed any carbon sequestration at all. Um, th these are the numbers behind this total sequestration forecast that's been created across the entire portfolio. And there's sort of a, a couple of things to note about this as well, is that you're not going to, with this get a perfect understanding of the exact situation of every single farm. But that's not really the objective at this stage. It's to sort of figure out the general distribution of your opportunities and your, your sort of risks so that you know who to start talking to. Um, because if if you go to, if you're, look, if you're for example, your focus is on um, retiring erosion prone land and converting it to forestry, and you start going and talking to landholders who are primarily orchardists or flatland dairy farmers, then you're probably not going to get very far because you know that the economic case is going to fall over pretty much straight out of the gate. And the, the risk profile for those um, landholders is also quite different. So step one is just get an understanding of the general region level distribution with farm level data so that you know which of these farms you can begin to engage with. And then we provide a whole heap of tooling around historical imagery, um, waterways layers, um, fish spawning layers and erosion, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, but to begin with, you've got to have everything in a place where you can start to move bits around and look at it in a way that's manageable and makes sense, rather than just having this gigantic hundred thousand hectare blob and you don't know where to get started. What this means, I think, is that it's almost like a 
a triage tool as well. Like if you are looking to maximize your impact around protecting existing native forest remnants, for example, um, it means that you can go straight to the farmers within your catchment or your sub catchment um, who have that mo the most native forest um, remnants for protection. So you, for the same amount of effort, you can maximize your impact. Yep. And you, you can also track the stage of that engagement. So something I didn't mention, but uh, Bex has highlighted it. Um, to begin with, we try and preserve a lot of anonymity for every one of the farms because like we we have title holder information, how that can be used is very restrictive. Um, so we just give it a region and a number. Um, however, once you begin to get more familiar with that landholder and you've actually spoken to them and onboarded them into the system, they might have, like in this case, it's still Her Majesty the Queen rather than His Majesty the King. Um, but they might have a particular name for this, like Hickory Bay um, Regeneration um, Reserve. Maybe it's under management by DOC or something purely speculative. So we now we now know a little bit more about who is there. And we also might, from our side of the um, sort of all the catchment group side, we know who within the group is primarily responsible for sort of moving that project forward and managing the relationship. And this is really key for engagement because you want to know that you've talked to them and that you've sort of, that they're interested and also who's gonna um, sort of be looking after them. It is gonna be, if, if you decide you want to do something further there that they're getting ongoing engagement from the same party. So a lot of that's built in um, for sort of tracking and delivery. Um, anyone else on that one, Beck? Or should I skip? We're good. Beck's. Um, so once you've sort of identified some areas, a key thing that you often want to, like, this is going to sound overly prescriptive, um, but it is a very common theme, is that a focus of many catchment groups is improving the water quality and land stability and biodiversity outcomes within the catchment. And often one of the things that involves is identifying and considering retirement of marginal erosion prone land especially if it has the potential to have erosion with sedimentation delivery to rivers. Um, so we're just going to have a quick look at how that might look within the platform. A key challenge, and here I'm going to jump over the hill to the um, creatively named Le Bon's Farm 2. A key challenge with erosion is that like often when people talk about erosion, you'll hear um, reference to two things. One is the land use classification. And the other is the um, erosion susceptibility uh, classification, which is a, a key thing for plantation forestry, particularly. And if I sort of if I zoom way out and turn on the land use classification, you can see that like it's not insane if we're talking about an area at kind of Canterbury scale. Like on balance, Banks Peninsula is more prone to erosion than sort of the big pastoral areas of the Canterbury Plains. Um, but as we begin to move in closer to this particular farm and, and even these valleys, um, you realize, and here we're just talking about land use, basically I can start turning off these layers and you'll see just how little actual information, and I'll turn off the boundaries so that we can see everything. Um, there's nothing in LUC8, there's nothing in LUC7, there's nothing in LUC5, there is something in LUC3, I got that wrong, there's nothing in LUC4, or two or one. So basically, oh wait, there was something in there. Which is that one? Oh, okay, there's a little bit of LUC4. Um, this is a pretty coarse assessment of the enormous diversity that occurs even within the small area. So you don't want to be saying something like, oh, let's plant all of our LUC6 plus land in forest because that's a pretty broad brush to be painting what's a pretty fine resolution kind of land use possibility with. However, it's not a terrible place to start in terms of which of my farms are potentially more or less susceptible to erosion and more or less like at risk. Separately from LUC, we've got um, the erosion susceptibility classifications, which include waterway, but you can see they're, they're pretty similar. They're informed by the same underlying data layers and they're at pretty similar resolution. Um, one that we're doing some work with, and I'll just see if I can quickly pull this up while oh, actually I'll finish this and then I'll come back to it if we can if we have a moment. But the 
the key point is that if we turn the boundaries back on um, and perhaps turn this erosion susceptibility layer off and move in a little closer, once you start looking at the farm itself, you begin to get a bit more of a sense of what's happening on the land. Like this whole slope here, you can see it's pretty steep. There's clear signs of slip activity in the past. You can begin to see where the existing fence lines are and what might be suitable. And, and so the, the key thing we wanted to show here is how quickly you can go from this view into a candidate scenario that could be discussed with the landholder of what they might want to do on their property. Um, not even what they want to do, but at least a, a, a sort of a, a possible intervention that might be of worthy of further discussion. And so let's say that we just carve out this area here. You can see I'm doing it pretty roughly and you'll see why in a moment. Um, so you can very roughly describe a polygon. Here I'm lining it up with the fence lines. It'll auto clip to the edge of the forest and it will also, once you tell it to, auto clip it to the edge of the actual land pastoral boundary. We now have a polygon that we can work with and we can custom define particular planting and vegetation mixes that we might want to use within this region. Like it could be that we're quite close to the sea. We want to use a mix of hillside ocean species, or we might decide that there's some biodiverse exotic mix that we've got for erosion control. And in each of these cases, you can define the plants per hectare that you intend to have or predefine them and your expected establishment cost. And you start to get a sense of what the likely costs are going to be for this particular intervention. And you know what you're talking about with the landholder and figuring, do, do we actually want to, do you want to retire this area here because it's pretty erosion prone? A key question that you're going to ask is, firstly, what's it going to cost me? And then what benefit is potentially going to bring me? Um, and in this case, you can see that the, and from this, you can calculate a, a sort of capital requirements and net present value and other things. But the, the key value, let's assume they decide to go ahead with it. Um, and so you go from draft status to this is confirmed. The landholder definitely wants to go ahead with this planting project in 2026. If we go back to our overview, um, where initially we had no forest planned, um, I better just check I've got the categories right there. Oh, yeah. um, if I refresh the dashboard, you can see that there is now 16 or 11 hectares of future forest that's within the, and this might seem like a lot of effort to go to for very little result in the case of a single farm. But the point is that you're going to be having tens or hundreds of these discussions across a catchment. And if you don't have an integrated tool to track them all and understand the outlook that they're creating, then you're going to have to do it all with your own spreadsheets and your own emails. And it quickly becomes, as we discovered early on when we were helping hundreds of people register in the ETS, it's a complete nightmare. Um, Whereas this here, you can track the financial forecasting, the expected land cover, the future carbon sequestration, the costs, the revenues, all within one place, regardless of who's eventually going to be the participant. And it could be the farmer that eventually decides to finance this project and, and register the land and um, have, have the ETS revenue. We're not, we're not prescriptive about how you implement the project, but you need to understand what the requirements of the project are to be able to create a plan for implementation. I think that's a really good point, Nick. And I would, um, maybe worth highlighting that one of the benefits of these tools is that um, it's collaborative. So you may identify potential areas on a number of farms within a, a subcatchment area around a particular water testing site. Um, but, you know, farmers don't know their land better than anyone else. So you go in with, hey, this is, this is some, you open the discussion with, here are some, you know, potential areas. Um, and then collaboratively work through what are your options? What are what are we going to do? What is the impact? Um, what are the costs? Um, so then it becomes instead of a top down prescriptive, you must or you should plant this area. It's much more collaborative, top down and then bottom up um, discussion. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't. I we're certainly not suggesting that planting plans can be done. Um, unilaterally from a area. No, no, quite the opposite, and that, which is what I was just going to flag here as well. Um, multiple parties can get access to this farm, so there's nothing to stop you. And in fact, we generally encourage you sharing it with the landholder um, and having them contribute as well and identifying bits that you can collaborate on. It's a really efficient way to sort of make sure you're talking about the same thing. Um, another, another key element too is understanding what's already there um, from a, a sort of a more detailed perspective. And if 
if I can just quickly show that one. So, uh, no, not that one. Um, a, a sort of a, a critical question is what's already going on within the property because often you'll be talking to farmers and like this is this is not the first time they thought about it they're not necessarily starting from scratch um part of what we support is simple integration of ongoing activities so in this case um let's say that this farmer already has or this landholder already has some registration within the ETS and they want to they've agreed to share it with you and you want to put it to within the system um, we can very quickly put you in a position where you understand the existing registered forest area. And so that's sort of like the stuff that you don't necessarily need to support the landholder with because they've already taken care of it. Um, so it sort of shows you what's left on the table. And this this also lets you sort of understand more detail around the specific yield forecasts for that site based on the existing activity. And all it takes is an agreement to share data and a single click rather than a whole bunch of remapping, which is then... It's just going to go out of synchronization again in fairly short order as new things happen. Yeah. Okay, should we jump to the next one, Bex? Yeah. All right. Um, erosion risk. So we talked about erosion quite a bit before. Um, as I mentioned, look, we've sort of got fish spawning, waterways. You've got the LUC stuff. You've got the um, the erosion susceptibility stuff. And we can figure out what the, this was one I drew earlier, what the implications might be of a particular restoration program across that area. What you really want to do at sort of the region level, um, if, if you're trying to sort of achieve a particular outcome for an entire catchment, is be tracking the, because you care about the catchment, uh, sorry, you care about the individual farm because you want to work with the landholder and help them achieve a good sort of optimised land use outcome. But at the catchment level, you want to achieve an optimized land use and, and sort of environmental outcomes for the entire region. So you'll be interested in things like, of my total erosion susceptible land across the region, how much of that is currently either drafted for planned planting or confirmed for planting? And what years do I expect that planting to be completed within? And this is how you can sort of, if you've got some particular goal, for example, like a, a certain amount of reduction in erosion exposure by 2030, you can use this to see whether you're on track for that goal by looking at how much planning, how much planting you have planned in each year through to that point by year um, and by erosion risk status. Um, I've sort of shown some of this already, but a lot of these interventions cost money. Um, there are a number of sources of potential funding, including things like riparian grants and the Hill Country Erosion Fund. Um, we are doing work to support further grant funding options um, within the platform, but a key one, and what many of these schemes sort of potentially depend on under the hood, is um, carbon revenue. Uh, and so as, as we showed before, we, we support cost modelling um, down to the individual sort of stand level for an intervention, or, or you could model the opportunity cost of the, let's say, a loss of um, agricultural productivity. Um, and we also support revenue modelling specific to the species and the planting environment that you have. And you can do this at portfolio level across the entire region, including the stage of registration. Because with the ETS, you don't start getting paid until you're actually registered. So eligibility isn't enough. You also need tooling to track these projects right the way through to delivery to make sure that your business case is actually going to work out properly because you're going to get the carbon credits that you expected on time. A couple of additional features we have around this that are proving really valuable to developers and other sort of financiers is um, our platform supports custom carbon yield models and custom carbon price models. So you don't just have to use a default assumption that we have. You can put in your own model with your own price curve that fits your own sort of acceptable risk profile and or, or potentially that of your financiers. Um, and the sort of another point we wanted to make is the None of like all of this is to some degree potentially valuable in and of itself, but it's most valuable once you have it all together in one place because you're you're planning for your afforestation activities and sort of the, the hectares that you plan to plant per year, for example, has implications for the seedling supplies that you'll need per year across the region for whoever you're sourcing them for. And both of these have implications for the costs that you're going to face, as well as the revenue that you might achieve. And you can see the importance here of like ongoing planning. Cost doesn't just occur in the year that you plant the trees. Um, there's site preparation costs, which have to happen the year before that you plant the trees and potentially um, nursery, um, what's the word? Like reserve, oh, I forget the down payments um, 
for the seedlings that you're looking to supply often need payment up front but also once you plant area you want to look after the trees as they grow and that has ongoing cost as well so you can see here that as the planting occurs there's this steadily increasing and in this case we've modeled it for three years retrospectively there's a like a for three years after planting, which varies by species and establishment environment and the sort of competing factors, you have to make an allowance for ongoing support of those trees to make sure that they actually start growing the way you want them to and you've got adequate pest and weed control particularly. Otherwise, you'll end up spending an awfully large amount of money and they'll all die and you'll be back when you started a lot poorer, which is in no one of these interests. Um, and then finally, you, you often a lot of this is not necessarily in the aid of making a buck it's in the, I mean although it may well be extremely valuable for revenue diversification for the farm it's it's more likely motivated at a regional level by some outcome which you want to track so here we've got the the level of erosion susceptibility um as mentioned earlier um sort of a related factor to this which we've also got um tooling in the works for is um reductions in expected volumes of sediment delivery uh, but another part is the sort of regional emissions footprint. So the all else being equal, the more regenerating forest you have within a region, the lower your net carbon emissions will be. That's not to say it's always a good idea to try and convert as much as you can to regenerating forest because there's there's a whole bunch of other factors. But it is a key variable as we try and move increasingly towards low net emissions um, to maximize the sort of sequestration potential of whatever asset base you happen to have. I feel like we've missed out about 13,000 things, Bex. But... <laughs> well, um, I had a couple of things I was going to jump in and talk about, actually. Um, I think one of the things that um, is useful and not necessarily immediately obvious about having all of your stuff in one place, or at least all of your tree-related things in one place, um, is that continuity. Um, you know, like volunteers change, coordinators change, your board or your committee, they change over time. Um, and so this having ha having all of your projects um, and a time frame of all of your projects since you started um, can be really valuable from a, a um, con continuity sorry, of impact um, yeah. and that sort of succession planning type thing. Which, um, which is the cue for something I did mean to show. So thanks for the prompt as well. Oh. <laughs> There's also an integrated task planning framework for this whole thing. We are steadily building out the number of tasks we support. But uh, let's say, for example, a key thing that we wanted to do was to assess the ETS eligibility of this forest. I'm going to make Bex do it because I'm lazy. Um, sorry. And this, so there's going to be a whole heap of activities like this across your whole portfolio of landholders that you're engaging with. And what we do is offer integrated task planning and delivery tracking across the entire portfolio. So now that I created a task for that particular farm, it's fallen into the catchment groups to-do list and we can track through that Bex is working on it. Um, she's now got it ready for review and she's going to assign it to me to take a look at. Um, this is really valuable for even just getting a task done atomically, but especially if you've got multiple people sort of playing different roles within the organization over different timeframes, it's a great way to stop having stuff fall through the gaps. Yeah. Um, I think another thing that we, um, just to go back to that preconception of, of where, we, where we were, where we started about just registering um, forests in the ETS, um, we uh, we are now you know providing the tooling for farmers to register themselves in the ETS or for catchment groups to support um, farmers to do that rather rather than relying on um, say carbon crop to do it for you uh, for a share of the revenue. Um, so there is there are opportunities ahead for catchment groups to create a more sustainable revenue source um, for themselves through ETS. So. Um, which could give you, as a catchment group, um, leverage to unlock further funding and further impact, um, which is, I think, quite exciting. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to say was more of a um, public service announcement that next year is the end of a period for the ETS. Um, and I encourage everyone, no matter how they do it, through carbon crop, through themselves, through a forestry consultant, 
please get your forest registered. Um, then you can back claim the three years of carbon because if your forest isn't registered by the end of next year, um, you'll lose that window to back claim. And that would be a shame. Yep. I think a slight, slight amendment there. Don't necessarily get your forest registered because for one reason or another, depending on your circumstances, it might not be the right thing for you. But you should at least make the assessment to understand whether it is or isn't because, yeah, what early 2026, it's not that it's too late, but it's too late for that three years worth. And three years of, let's say, a typical hectare of regenerating native forest might be getting, let's say, 10 tonnes per year is not a not an out, well, even more conservative, five tonnes. That's still at $63, five tons is about $310 per year. Over three years, you're going to lose. It's $1,000 per hectare that will be off the table permanently for that regenerating forest. And if you do plan to restore it and you do want to have it registered in the ETS eventually, there's a lot to be said for doing it before the end of next year. And it takes time to get a registration through. So don't leave it until July next year. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, if any of this has struck a chord, we are super keen for feedback. We are talking to a lot of people around implementation, but we're keen to talk to more. Um, step one is to get in touch with Bex. Her details are there. You can also find them on our website. Or if you're in a catchment group and you think that this might be something for the catchment group sort of coordination team to take a look at, um, send the webinar on to them or just let them know that it occurred and they should get in touch. Yeah. That's it for the day. Um, thanks very much for joining. Really looking forward to hearing from those of you who are working in this space around um, how you see these tools could be useful and how they could be more useful. Um, sorry, we only got to scratch the surface of how it can work, but we ran over time anyway. So um, yeah, expect more to come. But thanks a lot. Any, uh, Bex, anything you want to say in closing? No, no. I think other than please investigate getting your forest registered by the end of next year. Good call. Yeah. All right. Thanks all. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.